So, hello and welcome to this sixth episode of A Grand Tour with my great-great-granddad. My name is Ed Hill and I'm trying to not go on as much every time now about what this podcast is about at the beginning because if you you don't know where I am now, you're never going to know, really. But in a micron, to sum up what I'm doing in these podcasts, is I'm reading from the journals of my great-great granddad William Mowbray Scott that were written way back in the 1840s about his travels around Europe and then Mexico and basically what happens is I read a bit stop and then I talk a bit about what he's just written and then I start reading again and then I stop again and then I talk about the bits I've just read again so that's it basically but yeah if you wanted to kind of know a bit more about the history as I've said on the previous podcasts, listen to the um, introduction episode and that will explain a lot there about the history of the journals and how they survived up to this time and how basically they've been prepared by me for the podcasts. I just thought I'd say at this point that listening back to some of the previous podcasts, you inevitably listen to things and you say, oh, didn't quite mean to say it like that or that doesn't sound quite right or could have explained that better or something like that and listening back to episode five I was kind of a bit aware that when I was talking about Josephine Baker that I don't know I kept calling her a, a lady and um not that there's anything wrong with calling her a lady but it just sounded a bit sort of patronizing you know a bit sort of little Britannish a lady and of course she was you know very heroic and interesting human being which i i did say but uh i don't know it's just the way i <laughs> refer to her as, a, as a lady it sounded a bit odd when i did it um, rather than a woman you know, i should have used the word woman but i used the word lady it's basically what i'm saying but in my defense what i would say is that i think what happens is that um, having read and discussed and talked so much about william's journals his way of expressing himself, I think, sort of rubbed off on me a bit, and I start, I start, I start sounding like a mid-Victorian gentleman. I mean, the other day I went into McDonald's and I asked for a uh, goodly round of one of your quarter pounders with cheese, with chipped potatoes, and a generous libation of your finest Fanta. Which, uh, I mean, to my surprise, the uh, the guy behind the counter just said, "Is that eat in or take away?" So that's, I just thought I'd say that. It's, it's nice to, to, to have a chance to kind of you know comment occasionally on what you've what you've done, and well, I don't get it right every time. And um, in a way, as I go through these things, I, I probably realise some of the sort of areas that I'm making about the history. But I, I'm, you know, not going into really really in depth with the history that I'm talking about. If you're really particularly interested in something that I talk about, of course, um, do, do your own research, of course. Do it yourself. I'm not doing it for you. No, but, uh, you know, there's there's plenty of resources out there where you can get the really in-depth things. And sometimes I probably will refer to that. as I might say, you know, this is a good point. In fact, I said that with Josephine Baker. She is a remarkable woman. So he used the right word there. And definitely worth uh, researching more about her life. So um, go ahead. Fill your boots, as they say. So that's it, really. But anyway, this long preamble got to stop getting back to where william is in paris in 1840 in uh i think it's winter time march did he talk about march yeah it's march march 30th he mentions in this next bit so it's cold winter time in paris basically this next bit is just him continuing his wanderings around this particular area of paris so let's take it away <laughs>
Next, I passed the port of St. Denis, a triumphal arch of considerable merit, erected to commemorate the conquest of Holland by Louis the Fourteenth, a conquest that was abandoned before the monument was half finished, that was intended to perpetuate the memory of the exploit. The next object to attract my attention was the Fountain of the Lions, situated on one side of the boulevards. It has a basin of not less than eighty feet, within which are placed colossal lions on pedestals of white marble, large streams of water flowing from their mouths. This fountain was erected by Napoleon, and though not so elaborate as that in the Rue de Richelieu, or that in the Place de la Concorde, has an air of much more sublime grandeur. A little further, and I stood on the Place de la Bastille, a large open space where the celebrated prison formerly stood, another of those instruments of tyranny and oppression that disgraced the government of France previous to the Revolution. Any person, however high his rank or station, that had the misfortune to offend the king, his ministers, or those in power, amongst whom might be mentioned the shameless women who held the title of mistress to many of those French monarchs, was seized by what was termed lettre de cachet. That was a uh, direct order from the king that he could sort of issue arbitrarily and, and basically just have someone imprisoned. And shut up here without trial or examination for very long periods, or perhaps for life, here also that bloated tyrant and proud churchman, Cardinal Richelieu, immured great numbers of his victims. This prison was built in the reign of Charles V by Hugh Abriol, who laid the foundation stone in April 1370. And the hand of providence was upon him for having excited the enmity of the Romish church, so powerful in those days, he was shut up in this prison for the remainder of his life. On the 14th of July, 1789, at the breaking out of the revolution, it was stormed by ten thousand of the citizens of Paris, armed with offensive weapons, and in three days not one stone was left standing upon another. In the centre of this space now stands a lofty and finely executed column to commemorate the revolution of July 1830. The top is surmounted by an emblematical figure of immortality, and the shaft of the column is covered with the names of those who fell in the defence of liberty on those three memorable days. In an enclosure adjoining, I saw the plaster design for a fountain made by the command for Napoleon, and which the present French government are taking active measures to complete and place in front of the column. The model is the full size, and it consists of a pedestal of 30 feet in length and 15 in height. On the top of this will be placed the statue of the elephant in bronze, about the size of four living ones. The water will flow in a large stream from the trunk of the animal, and in small ones from betwixt his toes, bearing some resemblance to what the effect would be of a monster of that size treading on marshy ground. From the appearance of the model and drawings I have seen, rich as the city of Paris is in fountains, this would totally eclipse the whole of them. Now, when I first read this extract, I was quite intrigued about uh, William's description of this massive elephant-shaped fountain and uh, the first thing that sprung into my head was I wonder if it was ever actually built and going into a little bit of research about it there is actually quite a lot of history around it and, and in a way it's quite a famous Parisian landmark of the time. It actually was first put in place in 1813 under the instruction of Napoleon but it stood there till 1846 so William is there about six years before it finally got dismantled. I've never quite got to the root of what the significance of the elephant was to Napoleon, but the idea was that this massive, massive bronze elephant was going to be made out of a melted down cannon from his uh, victories, so from the cannon of his enemies. But obviously Napoleon was deposed. The original architect was someone called uh, Jacques Célérier, and then there was a, another one who took over called Jean Antoine Alavon. Forgive me if I've pronounced those wrong, but it was massive. It was 78 feet high, and the legs were 6 feet wide, and beneath that as well, there were kind of a whole load of tunnels and plumbing to provide the water to it, but this never happened. So, in fact, it was, it was so big that there was a, a sort of guard who um, actually lived in one of the legs to protect it. 
I mean, just to give you a brief idea of what it looks like, it looks like an Indian elephant, and it's got on top of it the the howdah. You know, those it's like the elephantine equivalent of a, a saddle that you have on the top of the elephant in which people sit. And um, so this thing is 78 feet high with this howdah on top of the back of the elephant. And as William describes it, the idea was that the big jets of water would come out of its trunk and then surrounding it would be all these other jets of water kind of pushing up big plumes of, of water around its legs. But as I say, it actually is quite famous in a way. It's uh, referred to in uh, Victor Hugo's Les Miserables because um, uh, Gavroche, who's uh, one of the main characters in that story, which I don't know, but he apparently shelters under it. And apparently when they made the recent film of the musical Les Miserables, they actually reconstructed a kind of scale model of it. I don't think it's obviously as big as the original, but with clever camera work, they could make it look as big as this thing. So I'll have to definitely have a look at that film and see when this scene comes up where this uh, huge elephant is built. It came to symbolise, if you like, the decay of the French Empire. This thing sort of stood there and in, in Les Miserables apparently... Victor Hugo describes it in very derogatory terms, um, just, just describing how it's decayed and bits of plaster have fallen off and bits of the framework have started sticking out from uh, the main body of it. And by the time it was taken down, it was very unpopular because it, it was thought to be attracting rats and vagrants and the people who lived in that area really wanted to see it dismantled. I mean, the idea was obviously... This area William's walking around is where the famous castle or prison of the Bastille was. I mean, he basically his, his sort of history that he pretty well accurate enough about it. So, and and obviously it was like famous because it's the first point where the original French Revolution really broke out is the storming of the Bastille. So, if you like, it, it represents the beginning of the French Revolution. So, as William says, this there was also this column that's erected there to commemorate the later revolution of July 1830. Now that was built and that is there. And at one time I was a little bit concerned because uh, I thought, well, the, the dates don't quite quite match up, but actually they do because um, as William describes it, it's, it's absolutely right because that was built from 1835 to 1840. So that would have just been finished when William was walking around. But next to it, obviously, is this large decaying plaster elephant and he says the French government are working to get it built. From looking at the research, it actually seems by the time William gets there, any chances of that happening had probably finished. The last attempt apparently was about 1835, and it was um, by the architect who wanted to see it built. I think he also designed the column as well, so I probably he wanted the whole ensemble of this thing to, to finally be put in place. But despite their efforts, it, it, it never it never happened. So, yeah, it does make sense. William would have been there not long after the column would have been finished, but um, there's also this great big plaster elephant nearby, slowly decaying. William doesn't mention what a bad state it was in, because it probably by 1840 it must have been looking pretty bad, I would have thought, but he doesn't say anything about that. And I, at one time I thought, well, I, I, I wonder why he doesn't say, oh, it looks in a sorry state. But then I thought about it, and I thought, well, bearing in mind, these are recollections, so he's actually... Th you know, writing and thinking back to something that, uh, you know, happened about four years before, four or five years before he's writing these journals. So I suppose, you know, you don't necessarily remember details so much in that way. And of course, he's just a passing visitor. He wouldn't have known all the, the backstory of it all. I suppose he was just told by someone locally there that, uh, yeah, they were going to build it, or perhaps there was a little sign saying that that was the idea. Uh, it's one of those um, moments in the journals where just in passing you think oh I wonder if they've ever built that and then you discover all this history around it there are some remnants of it left in fact I think the column now sits on the plinth which had been designed for the elephant to sit on and also just to mention the idea was also that people would be able to go up a spiral staircase up one of the legs and go right up to the top of it and um, view Paris from the howder. But that that is the only bit that's left is the sort of base part of it. So whether they move the column later or I'm not quite sure. I, from what I can see, this area is now quite a busy traffic area, so it's a little bit hard to um, know what it looks like now. But quite an interesting story of the 
the sad, decaying, at one time great elephant of the Bastille. Boulevard and turning up the street to the left, I passed the modern prisons of La Palage, Saint La Palage. That was actually the prison where the Marquis de Sade was was held, and that of La Force. And in a few minutes, found myself in front of the gates of the cemetery of Père Lachaise. This wonderful place occupies a commanding eminence on the north of Paris and covers a considerable space of ground. I should say not less than fifty acres. The surface is irregular and undulating, planted with trees, and divided by gravel walks in serpentine directions, much like an English pleasure ground. Viewed from some of the higher parts, it bears a great resemblance to a number of miniature villages. The graves and tombstones are surrounded with flowers, and the air literally glows with perfume. It was but the evening before that I had mixed with the frivolous and licentious crowd that thronged the avenues of the Palais Royal, that I had marked the variety and costume that distinguished the natives of the different regions of the globe. Now I stood in the last resting place of man, the variety was still the same. There stood the celebrated tomb of al and Helwa, so famed in song and story. So they, they were basically two French, famous French lovers from medieval times. So uh, that's the story that uh, William's alluding to there. The crescent, marking the spot where some follower of Mahomet mingled with his mother earth. The Latin cross, to show where rested some pious son of the Romish church. The Isi Reposa, that's resting place, of one of the reformed faith. The cross of the Greek church, denoted that some native of Russia or the Grecian islands slept beneath, whilst others told me in my native tongue that some fellow countrymen occupied the narrow cell beneath. Others in the same language pointed to the spot where some son of the far Atlantic had found a grave amongst strangers. Père Le Chase is not the burying ground of the Catholic, nor yet the Protestant, but it is like the mighty city of which it almost forms a part. Here meet all nations and all kindred and tongues, Christian and infidel, Catholic and Protestant, Jew and Gentile, here all sleep together. One tomb sculptured with the implements of war showed me where a sturdy old warrior had been conquered by a still mighty warrior death. Another raised by a nation's gratitude to one of her greatest, brightest statesmen. Others told of the loss of a child, a mistress or a parent but all marked by some feeling of affection for the dead. And it certainly is a very redeeming quality to the generally reputed frivolity of the French people to see them as I did on that day, the ground filled with people seeking out the grave of some relative or friend and bringing a garland of flowers to hang upon the tomb. And I was also given to understand that it is a regular custom for several months after the death of a friend to visit the grave at regular periods and to bring garlands of immortals a bright yellow flower to ornament the tomb. The memorials to the dead in Pierre Lachaise consist of two distinct kinds, those of the lower classes, who are buried in common graves, similar to the village churchyards of England. They are merely surrounded by a light iron or wooden railing, a cross being planted at the head and bearing the age and name of the deceased. At the time of my visit, great numbers of violets and primroses and other flowers were blooming in this part of the enclosure. The other part is all vaults, and as the ground for them is purchased, they become private property, and the owner is at perfect liberty to erect what kind of monument he thinks proper. A great number of them are precisely the same as a small Roman Catholic chapel, with an altar and crucifix, and many of them that I looked into, for they have both windows and doors, were hung around with paintings and portraits of the departed. Others again contained rich silver and gilt candlesticks. Others beautiful lamps kept constantly burning, beautiful china vases filled with the choicest flowers. In fact, the variety of design, the diversity of ornaments, the marks of affection and remembrance towards those they had parted from forever in this world, was wonderful and astonishing to the highest degree. 
In the course of my ramble, I noticed the names of many of my fellow countrymen, some of them whom were well known to me, many of them men renowned in science and arts and literature. One monument that particularly struck me was the one created by the French nation to the great statesman, Casimir Perrier. So he was a, a former prime minister of France. It is a finely executed statue of that celebrated man, standing on the apex of a pyramid. A large and splendidly ornamented chapel stands in the centre of the ground. It was with the greatest reluctance that I quitted this spot, and not then till the shades of evening surrounded me, and the voices of the keepers pronounced that the hour of closing the gates had arrived, that I tore myself away and hastened to my hotel. And I may as well notice in this place that if I were a resident of Paris— and completely master of my time, there are but three places where I could freely enjoy myself. Namely, the Jardin des Plantes, where I could gaze upon the wonders of creation and the handiworks of an almighty providence, the galleries and museum of the Louvre, there to behold some of the finest works of the painter and the sculptor, and the grounds of Pierre Lachaise, where, out of the noise and bustle of the city, I could muse and moralise on the vanities of the world, and here, surrounded by the mighty dead, think of that of which is to come. So, as I was reading this the first time, I thought, oh, is that that famous cemetery where Jim Morrison and other celebrities are buried? And uh, it is. It is this very big cemetery in Paris. It's the largest one, 44 hectares, that's 110 acres. So it's, it's, it's massive. It was opened up in 1804. There'd been churches and religious sites there before, but again, Napoleon decreed that it was opened. And it's interesting there, the reference that William makes to all these different religious denominations being present in the church, because Napoleon stipulated that there should be a an area for each religion created in the cemetery. So that's why, in a way, it's a, a non-denominational burying ground. So there isn't any one particular religion that takes precedence over the others and that's pretty well stayed the case ever since it was created there are a lot of famous people buried there probably the most famous recent person well not recent but very well known is uh, Jim Morrison from the Doors but uh, Edith Piaf is buried there Frederick Chopin Marcel Proust lots of famous people have been buried there but it's estimated that there have been more than 2 million people buried there down the years. So that is pretty incredible. And you can still get buried there today, apparently. There's still a few plots, but um, not many. And actually, you could almost, it sounds like actually there aren't really any actual bits of spare ground, but you can sort of take out a lease on a plot that's been uh, neglected, or you can... <laughs> Apparently in some areas people just keep, from the same family, they just keep burying people in the same, in, a, in the same hole as it were. <laughs> so <laughs> generation of generation have been buried in that hole. <laughs> um, so, yeah, my great grandfather, going back to grandfathers again, my great grandfather's buried in that hole, my grandfather's buried in that hole, I'm going to be buried in that hole. <laughs> so because apparently they just let the bodies decompose and then they shove a coffin on top. So that's another way that you can still get buried in Pierre Lachaise. Uh, but yeah, that's really all I'd say about it. You probably will, maybe if you vaguely know Paris history, like myself, you go, oh yeah, that sounds, I wonder if that's Jim Morrison. <laughs> and yeah, it is the one where Jim Morrison is buried. Just to say, he does have a good turn of phrase sometimes, William. Uh, that little summing up of the cemetery and his time where he'd like to spend his time in Paris. You know, it's 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 actually nicely written. So I, I criticise him at times for being not a great writer, but occasionally he does have a good turn of phrase. Uh, we haven't got to his poetry yet, though, so... Um, but anyway... <laughs> After I had dined, I again sallied forth and wandered through the streets. In the Rue saint Anne, the church of saint Roche was splendidly illuminated, and a great number of priests were chanting the evening service of the Roman church. In the English church, near the British ambassadors, 
as a large and respectable congregation. In the boulevard and other places, the people were crowding into the theatres. The shops and the cafes of the Palais Royal were full of visitors, whilst a great number paraded up and down the arcades in the garden. The voices of singing and merriment was issuing from the windows of every wine shop, and such, such indeed, was the picture of a Sunday evening in Paris. March 30th. This day was devoted to visiting the Palace of the Louvre, the Palace de Carousel, the Church of saint germain lex loire and the Bourse, or Exchange. The Louvre is the old royal palace of Paris. It is situated behind the Tuileries, a splendid quadrangle edifice with a court in the centre, completed by Napoleon. It was begun by Philip Augustus in 1214. Charles V from the year 1364 to 1380 added some embellishments to the building. Francis I erected the part now called the Old Louvre in 1528. Henry IV laid down the foundation of the splendid gallery which connects the Louvre on the north side with the Tuileries. Louis XIII erected the centre, and Louis XIV according to the plan of Perrault. The elegant façade towards the east, together with the colonnade of the Louvre, is even now allowed to be the most perfect work of architecture in France. After the Emperor Napoleon had taken possession of the Tuileries, he began a second gallery opposite the former, by which the two palaces would have been made to form a great hole with a large quadrangular court in the centre. Only 600 feet were completed at his abdication, and it was only a few months previous to my visit that the present government had come to the resolution of finishing it. The interior of this palace contains nine galleries of paintings. The first three are devoted to the productions of the French school, the second three to the German, Flemish and Dutch schools, and the last three to the Italian. A gallery of antique sculptures on the ground floor and another of drawings on the fifth floor. Then there is the Museum of Curiosities, natural and artificial, occupying a great number of rooms, all fitted up with splendid cases. The walls and ceilings painted and gilded in the most superb style. There were all kinds of ancient armour and weapons, Egyptian mummies, Etruscan vases and lamps, mosaics inlaid with gold and precious stones, models of ships of war of all nations and ages, models of islands and fortifications, models of machines in various departments of the arts and manufacturers, vases of porcelain from the royal manufactory of Sèvres, gobelin tapestry, needlework, and thousands of other articles that it would be impossible to mention. But there was one thing particularly struck my attention, that though the British Museum may, and certainly does, contain a large collection of articles, yet in this of the Louvre the clarification is much superior. The rooms are smaller, and each room being confined to one department or class, the attention is not so distracted, nor the senses bewildered, as they are in London. Add to this that they are all on one floor, and each case is merely numbered with a label in the French language, and at the doors previous to entering you can either purchase or hire a catalogue in either the English, Italian, Spanish, Flemish, Dutch or German language, which you cannot obtain in London, and the stupid practice that obtains in many of our public exhibitions of giving the Latin terms only, a language that no one in one thousand of the people of England understands and which nine-tenths of those who place those things, though they may be able to write the language, yet do not know how to pronounce it, is not the case, allows for much clearer understanding. On the day I visited the Louvre, the number of visitors was very great, yet there was not the least crowding or rushing whatsoever, and the officials, all clad in royal livery, were ready to open you a door or offer you a seat. It shows you that in this respect at least, the French people, and the government perhaps I ought to say, understand those things better than we do in England. Next, I took in the Palace de Arc de Carousel. This vast space between the Palace of the Louvre and the Tuileries is adorned by a fine triumphal arch in the centre, of beautiful marble, forty-five feet in height, and was erected by Napoleon after the conquest of Italy in 1806. He placed on the summit the celebrated horses and a car from the Square of St. Mark at Venice but they were claimed by the Austrians and taken back in 1815, but others have been placed there since 1830, and the structure therefore is again complete. Above the columns at the face of the arches are colourful figures to represent the different companies of soldiers of the empire. The general appearance of the arch is very fine, 
but when seen at a distance it struck me as being much too small for the vast space it stands in, the only one of Napoleon's works that I know of that possesses such a fault. An iron railing runs across the square, within which, on the side next to the Tuileries, the guards parade every morning, with military music, and in this place Louis-Philippe reviews his troops. I was present during my stay in Paris at several of those reviews, and the effect was very fine. So, uh, just thought I'd mention at this point a little bit about the sites that uh, William is talking about here. Obviously the Louvre, which um, he describes pretty accurately, I suppose, and the history and everything is, is um, accurate there. I do quite like that little bit where he's just talking about how um, things are easier to sort of comprehend and understand in the Louvre, um, because uh, they don't uh, use just the Latin term for things, which is uh, just a nice little observation from him. It's not that often that William actually says something is done better in another country than, uh, than it is in uh, in England. So this is a relatively rare occasion where <laughs> he's praising another country for what they do rather than... Uh, they do in Blighty. The Arc de Carousel. Sorry, I just had to stop there to, to let the cat in. <coughs> right. It's not the kids, it's the cat. <coughs> um, anyway. Yes. So, getting back to the Arc de Carousel, this is another arch um, that's very similar to the Arc de Triomphe, but much, much smaller, as William sort of observes, saying it looks a bit small for one of Napoleon's monuments. Not a huge amount to say about that, other than apparently the Marble Arch in London was sort of um, based on the design of this this arc so marble arch was built a little bit later and just to talk a little bit just because it's a word i hadn't learnt before but um that reference to the sculpture of the horses on the top that's known as the quadriga which napoleon looted from venice after one of his victories in italy that that was a very ancient statue um, of the four horses and um yeah it's called the quadriga I didn't know this, but anyone who's watched all those films of uh, things like Jason and the Argonauts and things like that when they have chariot races, that's when you have the four horses in front of a little chariot and they're all four side by side. And um, that is known as a quadriga. And it was often depicted as a sort of uh, image of victory. So um, the one that Napoleon nabbed from Venice again after the Battle of Waterloo, when, you know, a lot of the countries who were victorious over Napoleon decided they wanted to get uh, things back. As William describes, the Austrians then nabbed them back and put them back in Vienna. Uh, Venice, not Vienna, Venice. And St. Mark's Basilica. So in France, they then had to make some new ones which were put back on, which are the ones that William is describing. Church of Saint Germain lex Alois, which is situated close to the Palace of Louvre, is a low though pretty large edifice in the Gothic style of the eleventh century. The only merit it possesses is some fine stained glass windows, and its numerous monuments bearing in some degree to our own Westminster Abbey. Amongst those most worthy of notice are the ones of Count de Calais and Claude Philippe de Troubleau's Comte de Calais, the Chancellor Olivier Malabre, poet Madame Dessier, Anne Dessier, she was a classicist, and here lay also most of the celebrated artists and painters of the last two centuries. So I'm just going to talk about the Church of St. Germain ex that William mentions here. This, this is going to be a long one. So pull your socks up, get a cup of tea, settle down. A couple of very simple things. At the moment, that church, because Notre Dame is out of action, because of the fire that happened a few years ago, 
St Germain XLY is in a way taking its place as the site where all the usual religious ceremonies that would take place in Notre Dame they're happening in this church so at the moment it's, it's, I suppose you could kind of say it's the principal church of France while Notre Dame is being repaired and uh, also a bit like the St Denis Basilica it's had quite a varied history particularly in the 19th century at one time it was a church and then it was made a gunpowder store and then it was a print works and then it was restored to being a church again so it's had a bit of a up and down history like that one very important thing about this church it's very hard to go into all the detail because it's very very complicated but a thing here happened in the 1500s called the St Bartholomew's Day Massacre and this is very very basically when a great many Protestant Huguenots who were about 10% of French society as it was made up then were massacred and it was a proper massacre I mean this wasn't like the St Valentine's Day massacre in Chicago where about 14 people died no I think it's estimated that about 3,000 Protestants were killed in Paris as a result of this day anyway the St Bartholomew's Day massacre happened here and the bells of this church were the thing that started it uh, sort of signaled that this massacre was going to take place what I would say is google it look it up and you'll then learn all this terribly terribly complicated history revolving around Catherine de Medici who was basically the mother of several kings in France of this time and it said that it was a real Machiavellian plot by her because there happened to be a more Huguenots in Paris at the time because there was a marriage happening of one of her daughters to a Protestant noble person who was Henry and who was later Henry the fourth who I've talked about previously and I said that he converted back to Catholicism from being a Protestant and I sort of suggested that he sort of chose that way it's a bit more complicated than that to be honest he was almost really forced to become a Catholic again really and this whole incident kind of is one of the reasons behind it and you can see that Catherine de Medici she's almost a bit like Elizabeth I she had tremendous influence on French society at this time but mainly because she was the mother of these three kings Francis II, Charles IX and Henry III and particularly with Francis and Charles IX they were all quite young when they first became king so she she wielded a lot of power behind the throne as it were but actually avert power as well she was at some point regent as well so a very interesting character but just to say on the actual day of the St Bartholomew's massacre it sort of was triggered as a thing to kill the Protestant hierarchy who it was felt were beginning to have a bit too much influence over the king particularly one chap called Admiral Gaspard de Cologne he became a sort of good friend of Charles IX and um, so Catherine Medici was a bit worried about his influence and she wanted him assassinated and after an initial failed attempt this so Bartholomew massacre started with him being found by the Swiss Guard again we have mentioned before going into the Huguenot areas of Paris they found him basically stabbed him threw him out a window cut his head off all very gruesome and then this massacre began and it seems sort of uh, almost as if sort of bloodlust took over the Paris population this mob this Paris mob oh dear <laughs> if you get on the wrong end of them <laughs> it doesn't seem much to trigger them into terrible actions anyway it, it was meant to be if you like mainly the Huguenot hierarchy that would be going to be sort of massacred. but anyway they spread into then really the whole population Protestant population of Paris being persecuted and killed by the Paris mob and it's said that the Seine was um, red with blood um, because so many bodies had been thrown into it at the time the Huguenots were about 10% of the population of France but they did tend to constitute if you like the more hierarchical elements of society the, the higher up sort of thing so perhaps there was uh, also maybe some motivation there of persecuting them it is very complicated uh, you know there was good and bad on both sides so it's certainly not a simple story I mean it's been suggested almost on a social sort of psychological level 
that this is an incident because it was very disturbing because it was Christian killing Christian and it's been suggested it's almost a demonstration of that sad tendency in the human race to exacerbate the things that make us different from each other rather than the things that are similar because the Huguenots looked a bit different they wore slightly different clothes and so forth talk about the long arm of history reaching out down the ages i mean you know we only have to think now of how there are still problems between protestants and catholics around the world and particularly close to home in northern ireland why, why can't we just all get along man and it was so important i'm going to quote now i don't know why i'm getting one I seem to be getting on my sort of high horse about this a little bit but i'm going to quote now something that pope john paul ii said in 1997 about this 400 years later he was in paris doing one of his papal visits and he thought he ought to mention this thing to some young people who he was giving a speech to at the time and i'm going to directly quote him which is a bit odd isn't it for me to do do this and i'm not quoting william here i'm quoting pope john paul ii in 1997 so it's 425 years after the massacre which happened on 1572 on the 24th of august a couple of days after my birthday Anyway, I'm going to directly quote what he said about this on that day, 400 years later. And he said to these young people, On the evening of August 24th, we cannot forget the sad massacre of St Bartholomew's Day, an event of very obscure causes in the political and religious history of France. Christians did things which the gospel condemns. I am convinced that only forgiveness offered and received leads little by little to a fruitful dialogue, which will in turn ensure a fully Christian reconciliation. Belonging to different religious traditions must not constitute today a source of opposition and tension. On the contrary, our common love of Christ impels us to seek tirelessly the path of full unity. So, there we are. 400 years later, Pope John Paul II felt he had to bring up the St Bartholomew's Day massacre so that's how important the ringing of those bells was on that day on the 24th of August 1572 now obviously William didn't know any of this he just was walking around the church looking at it going nice stained glass windows nice nice pews <laughs> nice altar other things that you get in church see it shows how lack of religious I am I don't really know what most things are in the church but this church unglamorous as it seems to be to William at the time, was involved in one of the most important incidents that happened in European history. As I say, it's very, very complicated. Look up the St Bartholomew's Day Massacre yourself, and it's one of those things when you're clicking on Wikipedia or internet or whatever it is, and you click on one thing and another and another, and you learn all about Catherine de' Medici, you learn all about the Huguenots. So a very interesting area of study. So I would suggest maybe doing that. Have a look for yourself, because it's really interesting, but really complicated too. This is the great thing about reading William's journals. You look up one sort of thing about something, and it leads you into this whole area of history that you then learn about. I mean, if someone had said to me, the Huguenots, I would have just said this very vague thing about, oh, didn't a load of them end up in Britain sort of as religious refugees, something, something like that, and I wouldn't have even been able to tell you when, you know. And so now I know an awful lot more about the Huguenot and the whole area involved there. Right, back to the journals. Sorry, that, that was a long one. Next, I ventured to the Bourse, or Exchange. This edifice is due to Napoleon, who laid the first stone on the 24th of March 1808 on the site of the old convent of the Brothers of St Thomas. Brognard was the first architect, and Labar completed it. It is certainly one of the first buildings of Paris. It presents a parallelogram 212 feet long and 136 broad, and the four fronts comprise of 64 columns of the Corinthian order, reaching the second story. This forms an imposing colonnade on each side of perfect proportions. A heavy style of fourteen columns in the principal front, with an ascent of sixteen steps, occupies the entire breadth of the façade. The bourse, or exchange itself, is thus raised on a sub-basement overlooking the adjacent houses. 
I'm going to stop now just because there have been a lot of things to talk about. I'm sure this won't always be the case because we're still in Paris and William's got to get all the way down to Milan. <laughs> oh dear. As I say, there are long bits of the journey that aren't as involved. Paris is, you know, there is so much to see there that that's inevitably why these episodes kind of take a bit longer to talk about. So I just ought to mention here as well, there's now a Twitter account linked to this podcast. It's called Scott the Historic, and that's at 3G Grand Tour. So if you want to go on to that Twitter page, you can tweet things about the journals there. Do follow me. It's uh, good to build up the numbers as, uh, as soon as we can, really. But at the moment, they're, they're woefully small. So, yeah, if I can build up more followers, that would be really great. And also, you can use that to message me, if you like, about any questions or anything else that uh, you may want to ask me further about the podcasts. So that'd be really great to get a bit of um, sort of two-way engagement going there. And it'd be nice to, to hear from you and uh, hear the things you like about the podcast and the things you don't like about the podcast. <laughs> uh, stop saying if you like. <laughs> Dear, as I mentioned in a previous podcast, you do become rather aware of your vocal tics and wheezes. Also with the Twitter account, I'll start posting up when new episodes are available on there as well. So I'm aiming to get a new episode up about every two to three weeks, if I can. Ideally two weeks. Um, and lastly, on the whole sort of social media side of things, do subscribe to the podcast as well on whatever platform you're listening to. It's on Amazon Music, it's on Spotify, it's on iTunes. In fact, now if you Google the Grand Tour with my great-great-granddad. The website will come up now. It's just a very simple website, just with basically the episodes on it. But I'm going to look into a bit more on to what I can put on there. It's uh, an Acast thing. So, and yeah, by all means support it if you feel that way inclined. It all it all helps pay the running costs because uh, I have to pay Acast a bit of money to host it. Anyway, that's the end of this sixth episode of A Grand Tour with my great-great-granddad. I hope you've enjoyed it, and do tune in again next time. Mm -hmm.